I'd like to start this morning by reading a section in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. <coughs> now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Seemingly a, uh, a harsh and abrupt statement by the Lord. The scene was that there were people that were filling Jesus in on, uh, on the latest of the current events of the day. And in Galilee, and Galileans were known for their fervent um, patriotic spirit and their hatred of Rome, there arose one of a series of uh, insurrections. A man appeared, gathered a, a uh, crowd of followers, and went to war against Rome. They were duly crushed by, by uh, Pilate. And to make an example of them, he bled them out, gathered their blood, mixed them with pig's blood, and then offered them in their temple as part of the uh, Roman sacrifice. Similarly, a tower fell and killed 18 people. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And I never got that for a long time. I was thinking about it this week. You will all likewise perish. Meaning that, am I going to be, am I, is my blood going to be mixed with pig's blood and offered as a sacrifice? Or is a tower going to fall on me? No, I don't think that's what Jesus was saying. But he, what he was saying is that you will meet a terrible fate unless you all likewise repent. You'll meet a terrible fate. I just, uh, I read that as kind of an introduction to the passage in Romans today because of Jesus' emphasis on this business of repentance. Really an important part of the entire salvation experience. Repentance. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, as we get into the book of Romans here today, we get into chapter 7, I pray, Father, that you would reveal great truths to us, deep truths from your word. How quickly we gloss over them, Lord. And, but I, I pray today that your spirit would, would touch us and reveal to us your truth, as you say he will. Lord, that uh, we would walk away from this understanding what you've said that Jesus' name.
Well, back in Romans 6, 4, I don't know if you remember some of this language, but it says, Though we, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. And then verse 6 of chapter 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And I found myself this week asking, is this theoretical or is this experiential? And what does this mean? And how important is it that we die and that we are crucified? And what happens if we neglect or even try to avoid this part? crucifixion and repentance and death are hard, you know. And it can be a bitter pill. A pill hard to swallow, especially as we get older and have become more entrenched in our ways. Well, here's the reason. Here's the reason that it's so important. It may seem a bit obscure when you first start. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? The law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. If I haven't died, the law still has jurisdiction over me. Have you died? If you haven't, it's still the old you and you're still in bondage to the law, according to what it says up here. The law still has jurisdiction over you. Listen to the words of John in his letter to 1 John. We read uh, verse 7 this morning. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, of course, everybody's familiar with. But verse 10, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I was thinking about that too this, this morning. If we fail to come to grips with our sin, we have not yet been born again. Perhaps this explains the behavior of many who would claim Christ, but maybe they really have. So Paul gives us a real-life example. Marriage. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. The marriage bond, or the law of husbands, as you would read it in the, in the Greek, is in force as long as you both shall live. But if the husband dies, the married woman is released from the bondage of the law. So let's try to put some illustrations together here to just show the truths of these things. The wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he's alive. By the law of husbands. <coughs> So then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law, so that she's not an adulteress, although she's joined to another man. So if the married woman 
marries another man, she earns a title of shame. She's called an adulteress. <coughs> However, the death of her husband dissolves the obligation of the law. And she's free to marry another without the stigma of being called an adulteress. I must pause here and address a misuse of this passage. A man uses this passage as a proof text in his teaching that a man's first marriage is the one and only marriage that God recognizes. And unless a person is in that marriage, he or she is living in adultery. It doesn't matter what the spiritual state of the person is at the time of his marriage. He's bound by law to that first marriage, and the only way to erase the stigma of adultery, if he's remarried, is to divorce his current wife, abandon his children, and return to the original wife. His teaching is false for several reasons. First of all, God makes all things new for a person who's been born again. Has the divorce marred the past of a new believer? That sin is forgiven and forgotten by God. 1 Corinthians 7 is the authoritative chapter on marriage in the Bible. The church in Corinth had all kinds, all types of marriage situations. And divorce was common in the Greek culture. So what did Paul tell new believers in that church? In verse 10, chapter 7. The Christian wife should not leave her husband. If she leaves, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, says Paul. So has the husband been abusive or unfaithful? Yes, she can leave. But she must either remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. It's a hard thing for a Christian wife to swallow, but the Lord gives grace. And the same principle applies to a Christian husband. Does this get violated? Yes, it does. And I believe God is gracious still and forgive still. But let's call it what it is. In verse 12, a Christian has an unbelieving spouse. This would have been common occurrence, a common occurrence in Corinth. One or the other, either the husband or the wife, became a Christian, but the other didn't. Paul's instructions if the non-Christian consents to live with the believer, they should not separate. Verse 15. An unbelieving spouse refuses to live with a believing spouse. What were Paul's instructions in this case? Let the unbeliever leave. The believing spouse is not under obligation in such cases and is therefore free to remarry. Verse 20, a person should remain in the condition in which he or she was called. So were you divorced and remarried when you came to Christ? Stay with your wife. Stay with your husband. God has forgiven your paths, and you are no longer an adulterer. Well, the misuse of chapter 7, 1 through 3, aside. How might we illustrate the principles that those verses give us? If the wife marries another man while the law of husband is in force, she's an adulterer. But, if she marries another man after her husband dies, she's no longer an adulterer. 
All this is pretty straightforward stuff. But now Paul makes an important shift in the application of his example. See if you can tell what it is. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. Can you tell what the shift is? It's not marrying another person, it's marrying Christ. Yeah, well, the wife, you have the wife, and you have the husband, and the husband dies. Okay? So, the new application is you have yourself, and you have the law, but who dies? Yourself or the law? Yourself. You would expect that the law would die if you followed through with the example. But it isn't the law that dies. It's yourself that dies. Okay? The woman represents me. And I'm the one that dies so that I'm free to marry another. I died. I became united in Christ's death. And the resurrected me, because I'm also, if I've been united in his death, I'm also united with him in his resurrection. Amen. Now I'm free to marry another. Christ. That makes sense? So the law didn't die. The Word of God endures forever. And God provides it for our use. Provided that we use it correctly. The law continues to convict us all of sin. And it continues to convict the unredeemed of their lost condition and the principle of sin that operates within them. But I died in my conversion and subsequent daily dying that I might be freed from the law and joined to Christ. And this is the union that bears fruit for God. So let's continue to try to illustrate. You and the law. You as yet unredeemed have not yet died to the law. So you're under bondage to the law. And you're represented as the married woman in verses 2 and 3 of Paul's illustration. By being under bondage to the law, the principle of sin <coughs> reigns in your flesh. And the law keeps arousing it. The law, in effect, flushes this principle of sin out in the open by making it sin more and more and more. And you're powerless to make any real changes in your life to stop. Sure, you can find ways to cope with it and to civilize it. But the sin keeps coming back at you. And back at you, and back at you. Unrelenting. Forcing you to obey. Now, oops, I thought I had that all correct. <laughs> Technology. But instead of the law dying, you die. You were baptized into the death of Christ. And your bondage to the law came to an end. But that's not the end of the story. You were resurrected with Christ. And the new you is now free to marry another. The Lord Jesus Christ.
Paul continues to hammer this point home. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. So when I was under bondage to the law, the sin that was in me reacted to the law and the fruit of that union was death. If you haven't died into Christ's death, you're still in bondage to the law. If you don't experience the reality of that death daily, the law still rules over you. The body of sin is active and alive in you and it still reacts in rebellion to the law of God. And that's why repentance is an integral part of conversion. I believe repentance is the conscious part of my death in Christ. Amen. Have you died yet? You cannot bear fruit for God until you do. I'll repeat this for emphasis because Paul repeats it. You as yet, as yet unredeemed have not yet died to the law. You're under bondage to the law. By being under bondage to the law, the principle of sin reigns in your flesh and the law arouses it. And you're powerless to make any real changes into your life to stop it. You can find ways to cope with it. You might even become religious, but sin keeps coming back at you unrelenting. And you must obey. In genuine conversion, you die. The aspect of the death you die that is conscious is reflected through repentance. In your union with Christ's death, you're freed from the bondage of the law and you're free to marry another the Lord Jesus Christ. Your marriage to Him is reflected in the new covenant changes that happen in the life of the believer. Have you died to that old life of sin? Paul says, you cannot marry another until you do. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. This verse is for all of you died and resurrected ones. You're still not a free moral agent. You were never created as such. You still got to serve somebody. But for the first time in your life, you can serve in the newness of the Spirit. And Paul will go on to describe the life of the Spirit in chapter 8. But we're not there yet. A couple things I want you to take away from this. You're not released from the law until you die. You'll not experience the freedom of that release until you, you are united with Christ in His death. And this is an essential element of conversion. Amen. Repentance is the conscious part of that death. Have you died? Or are you still hanging on to your former life afraid of what all things become new? will really look like. Don't be afraid. Jesus is very, very good. If you have died, for heaven's sake, don't go back to your old husband. The law is a terrible taskmaster. There's a glorious gain in the cross. Although it might be unsettling 
and it is unsettling to leave the bondage of the law because that's all we've known entering into the freedom of Christ's resurrection entering into that freedom is a wonderful thing the pursuit of the beautiful life of righteousness is a glorious thing let our last song this morning be your prayer. It's a song of death and resurrection. Please stand and sing with me, Jesus I know.
resurrection. If we're united with Christ in his death, we shall also be united with him in his resurrection. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. But that's only the beginning of the rest of the story. Death comes before resurrection. Is Jesus calling you? He bids you come and die that you might live again and receive a blessing. The blessing of union with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. For those of you that would like to pray about something this morning, I and some elders will be up in front if you'd like to pray about anything. But I bid you come and die. That's where the freedom is at. In your, night, in your unity with the death of Christ. Amen. Amen.